Before we begin class, just uh, making a little bit of a mic check. Uh, I do know <coughs> we had a little problem last week with some of you hearing me, and uh, I talked with Harrison, so we'll try to get this mic uh, high enough to where we, uh, you can hear me, but you don't get uh, uh, syndrome coming back through. You know that thing, it screams and makes everybody grab their ears, but we'll try to keep it in between that and uh, where you can hear. Can everybody hear me if you'll just hold up your hands? Okay. Joanne's kind of my little, my critic back there. She tell me, I said, do you tell me now what, what we need to do to make the class as functional as we can in a dysfunctional situation, which COVID-19 is certainly that. Uh, but if you can hear me, <clears throat> we're gonna format it a little bit different too. Uh, Harrison is going to be, as, as I recount the story of Ruth, he's going to be flashing up those scriptures behind me. <clears throat> We're not going to read them. I'm going to make that a class assignment. As I go through the story of Ruth, Harrison will flash those scriptures up, and I just uh, encourage you all to have your Bibles ready and read those scriptures as we're, as we're conducting the class. I think it will help streamline it a little bit so we're not so herky-jerky up and down. And so I'm just gonna stand up here and lean on this pulpit uh, uh, and, and we'll get through this. And I hope it's uh, uh, rewarding for you. Uh, are we live now, Harrison? Okay. We welcome you all to our class this morning. We're doing a study on uh, women of the Bible. Uh, I've enjoyed it. It's a previous study that we discontinued after the COVID hit, and uh, we're going to, we have now restarted it with Eve last week and uh, Ruth this week. Uh, I have really enjoyed the study of Ruth. It's a small little book that's kind of stuck in between the big books uh, in the Old Testament. <clears throat> but it's what makes it special to me is it's about real people and people that uh, have struggled in their lives, have gone through difficulties, and it's primarily female people that have gone through this. So um, one of the things that I enjoyed so much <clears throat> about Ruth is the fact that I see this in, in Stroudsville Church, how women have their own little uh, sorority, if you want to call it, given it a secular name, but you ladies can minister to one another, and I see it every Sunday, I see it every day practically, that you're always watching out for one another, encouraging one another. Uh, Judy always, when she comes back from her sewing class on Friday, she's always got, a, a, oh, so-and-so's, well, she needs our prayers. Uh, we've got this and that going on. And women can exchange uh, information so much better than us men. You know, we kind of hey and grunt and bump fists or things like that. We're good at that. But women can express their heartfelt thoughts and sympathies and can empathize. They just don't sympathize, men, uh, like we do. We feel sorry for people. They empathize. They put themselves there. And so it was with Ruth and Naomi. And so as, as, as I am, um, begin this story uh, about Ruth. Uh, she is one of those rare women who, uh, as they say in Tennessee, she didn't have a dog in this fight. She was, she was a Moabitess. And uh, uh, Moab uh, is a kind of an uh, uneasy subject for the Jews because Moab was the son of one of Lot's daughters and of course we know what happened with lot you know they they were they were in the sodom and gomorrah sodom actually but uh lot was a compromised man he was compromised practically from the time abraham had to go save him uh from sodom because they he and his family were so embroiled in that remember what happened to his wife she still could, you know, God says, don't you even turn your back. Don't turn back, look back at them. Don't do it. Just straight forward and get away from that place as fast as you can. I see you nodding your heads. You remember the story. And she didn't. And she turned to a pillar of salt. 
Well, those daughters of Lot's and Lot himself, I'm not excusing him at all, uh, when they fled, uh, all their kinfolk that was left, including Lot's wife, was left there. And that was total destruction. We, we had a study on one of my classes about that. And it was total destruction. And, but anyway, these daughters, uh, you know, it's one of these, seemed like a good idea at the time. They were scared to death that that, that was the end of mankind. As far as they knew, there was no more earth as we know it, no more human beings, just us and Lot. So they come up with this little contrivance of, uh, and it kind of makes me feel creepy just talking about it, but it is what it is, as David sometimes says. Uh, we have this, it's, uh, these daughters, they said, well, you know, we're not going to have any progeny, any children left unless we have them with our father. Ooh. But, and yet we probably had the same reaction. But, but in fact, this is what they did. They got him drunk, you know. Uh, and I still got questions in my own mind about the impropriety of that whole thing of how he let himself get in that situation as, w as well as them placing him there. But it, having said all of that, it happened. And one of the daughters, the oldest daughter, had a child named Moab. And these are the descendants, Ruth's forebears, or, or you know, ancestry, is in that mix of Moab. That was a wellspring, just like we talked last week about all, we're descendants, Eve's our grandma, all of us. Well, so it is with Moab as the male descendant, that became the, the Moabites as a, as a country uh, within the framework of, of uh, what Ruth was going through. She didn't ask to be a Moabite, it's just the way things were. And it, the beauty of it is, is God's plan, and there's a message in this for us, folks. The people we pick so often aren't the people that God picks. He introduced sometimes people in among us, Moabites. They're in here, they don't quite look like us, they don't quite talk like us, and yet God's placed them among us, and he's asked us to say, okay, now do you get it? You get the, the way Ruth was treated by my, the children of Israel uh, back in the day? Well, it's kind of this way too with, uh, with Ruth. She is an exceptional woman. Uh, I can't say enough kind things about her. And if you learn one thing in this study of the book of Ruth, to me, it is Ruth. And it's the most important thing you take from that. But there are other appendages to this that t tells you about the kindness and the goodness that Ruth surrounded herself. She was drawn to Naomi. Let me give you a little I love history, family, ancestry. My wife can tell you that about drive her crazy with it sometimes, me and my research. But um, when, when Ruth uh, married one of Naomi's sons, her sister, Oprah, married another one. And so uh, if any of you have in your families where you've got that deal, I've got, I've got moms, mom's brother married dad's sister. Uh, it sounds like incest, but it's not. You know, they're just, you're, you're double cousins when you have them. I think we've probably got some in, in uh, Stroudsville congregation. But uh, saying that to, to help you understand, uh, close family was everything. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of nowadays they call it tribes. You know, it's your tribe. We're the Stroudsville Church of Christ tribe. Well, maybe that's an oversimplification but we are intertwined in one another's lives. And so it was in their time too, that here Naomi, who was, uh, I, I will, one thing I get, get kind of thinking of things pop in my head. You say, well, what in the world was a Jewish woman doing in, in, um, in Moab with a bunch of Moabites? Well, thing back then, uh, you remember, any of you here remember when there was the depression there you go, see? That was, a, that was our folks' generation. My parents went through that with a whole passel of my brothers and sisters, and they can tell you they remember the Depression. Most of them aren't with us any longer. But 
we were kind of the post-depression group. Well, in the Depression, they had in the middle of this country, in the, in the late 1920s and early 1930s, it was called, you ever heard of the Dust Bowl? Okay, one. So we're in a re-education program here, folks, of just current history, let alone past history. Well, the Dust Bowl was basically a big chunk right in the center of the United States in Kansas and Oklahoma where you couldn't grow nothing. And if, if, has anybody ever been through a long drought where everything was just burnt to a crisp? If you try to plant something, it, the seed would die practically. That happened to them. That happened to the Jews. And there's an old saying, you follow the green. And if it's not green, you better keep going till you find something green, because if it's not, it's nothing's going to grow there anyway. So this is, this is where Naomi was, and a lot of other Jews. They had no place to go but Moab because there wasn't anything green. They kept going until they found green. They split down. And, and most of these folks were uh, harvester gatherers, threshers. Uh, that's really what uh, Naomi did and her family did. So they would grow grain. They would harvest it, thrash it, eat it, and survive. And if they had anything left over, they'd sell it or barter it. Uh, much simpler time than our time. You know, we don't even think about that. We just run to the grocery store. They had no grocery stores. If they, if they survived, they grew it, they harvested it, and they ate it. Pretty simple formula. But the reason I'm telling you all this, so often in our uh, 2020 minds, we have trouble relating to that. You know, you actually, what in the world did that woman go with people that the Jews wouldn't associate otherwise and they become a part of their culture. Well, need necessitates sometimes fellowship, and so it was with Naomi. And so here you have this family as such, uh, Naomi's husband, he dies. She still sticks around there for about 10 years. Her sons die, uh, the one that was married to Ruth, the one that was married to Oprah. And Naomi, uh, she calls those girls in, as you can imagine. They're all heartbroken. They're widows, all three of them. And, and Naomi says, well, girls, I can just hear, you know, being a loving mother-in-law, she says, you probably need to stay here. You've got more family. You've got more kinfolk here than I, as, or as much as I've got up there in with my kinfolk, and that was the Jews. And so... Naomi basically was cutting her girls loose, heartbroken as she was, didn't want to do it, but she didn't see really any alternative unless it was God's. Now, through this all, whole thing, is one of the things that is beautiful about this, is out of that little close-knit family that was about to split up, one daughter-in-law chose God and the family of God. The other daughter-in-law chose family with not necessarily their God, because the Moabites had their own gods, and that created a lot of problems throughout. The, <clears throat> the Moabites were kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, getting a frog in my throat, <clears> throat> uh, or like the Amalekites. They didn't like Jews, and it was almost like I'm kind of ashamed, kind of like the Samaritans were. They were treated as a, as a kind of a left-handed, uh, shameful, you know, they're, they're Samaritans. Don't mess, mess with them. Don't mess with the Moabites. Don't mess with the Amalekites. And it was a reciprocal. They didn't like the Jews any more than the Jews liked, it, liked them. And so here we are, this loving mother-in-law who's a widow and put, calls her two daughters in and says, Girls, if, if you want to, if you want to uh, go, you can go. And one of the most beautiful things, uh, and if Harrison's back there, can you, can you show the scripture, Harrison? Because uh, I would like to, you and us all to read this. This scripture is whether thou go, whether you go, I will go. I've heard this used not only in uh, 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 different classes, but in weddings. Uh, couples have taken that and kind of transliter transliterated it to talk about a, a, a husband and a wife and making that commitment to one another. Uh, for life. But what's ironic about that is 
<clears throat> it's not talking about a man and a wife. It's talking about a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law. They're not even biologically related. And yet, this scripture is Ruth talking to Naomi. And I find it one of the most stirring and one of the most reassuring uh, scriptures uh, that you could ever hope to find. Uh, did you get it on there, Tom? Okay. I'm going to turn. Verse 16. Verse 16, if you'd like to take your Bibles. Again, we're, we're f fumbling around trying to find a way to do this and still honor the scripture, but also uh, honor you as a class. But read this with me. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. I wonder if Ruth really realized how profound those words coming from her mind. She said, I, your people, God's people are my people. Boy, isn't that stirring? She's saying, I got it, Naomi, I, I understand. And that's why I'm going to go with you. And that's why we're going to leave Moab, the place of my birth. And we're going to go the place of your birth. Uh, to me, that is such a reassuring. You know, all God's asking is just saying, I'm going to stick with you, Lord. I'm going to stumble, fall, and get up and move on. Uh, my work's not going to be any easier. Uh, you're going to bless my life in ways I never understood. But yet, having saying that, Naomi was committed to return to her homeland. And don't we love it here? Uh, I'd hate to be in Naomi's shoes and be up in Canada or down in Mexico and wanting to go back and be with my kinsmen. And yet, this is what Naomi did, and this is what Ruth was willing to do. She said, I have a clearer vision of God and his people, and I like what I'm seeing, and I want to be a part of it. If I can't be genetically connected, I want to be spiritually connected. And when it comes down to it, folks, what's greater? That we're genetically connected, that somehow I can prove that John and I are 14th cousins, or John and I are brothers in Christ. How much closer does that get you, folks? Brothers and sisters in Christ? Scripture tells us that that's what we need to address one another. That's kind of gone out of the church. I've still got people in church. I, I feel like I can't address them any other way. I, and I'll, I'll slip up and call you Brother, brother Gene or uh, Brother Wes or uh, Brother Dean. I, I still can't call him anything but Brother Dean. That's just me, and that's Dean too. But the reason I'm telling you that is don't fight that. Don't, don't war against the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit moves you to call one another brother and sister, do it. And you know what? It's amazing how that makes you feel that much closer. And Naomi and Ruth realize that. Ruth especially realized that. And so as we go on into this uh, study of Ruth, uh, here they are. Can you imagine two women? Two women on this trip. I, I, I didn't take the time to look at about how many hundreds of miles that trip took them. But that alone, you know, that was an act of faith because you, I'm sure they went through some unfamiliar and unfriendly territory, and yet they were willing to risk it all for the opportunity to be closer to God. And so as they made their trip, got there, uh, they had, you know, one of the things that struck me is uh, they're, here they get there and they don't have a thing, just literally the clothes on their back. <clears throat> so often even the grain that they would collect would, uh, their, their carrying thing would be their part of their cloaks. They would put their so many gomers of grain in their cloak and that's how they transported a lot of their stuff. You know, it didn't, didn't even have a pot to put it in and so here they are they show up and uh, they uh, anybody ever heard of a redeemer kinsman you know what a redeemer kinsman is Jim okay uh, probably uh, Gene does a redeemer kinsman was someone that was some of your kinfolk but 
kinfolk you not necessarily like a brother or sister. The Jews had set up this system, which is a, a really one of the things that, the, that made the Jews unique from the other nations. Uh, you know, some of them were killing their babies and sacrificing them and uh, doing everything else. Here you had these Jews that they had made an appropriation for you if you were an outsider and you come into their nation. God told them, said, you feed these people. You help these people out. You help them survive. They haven't come here because they necessarily wanted to. They're here because they have to be here. And one of the things about drought, like I was saying, uh, in our Dust Bowl, I, honestly, folks, I'm a little shocked. I'm the only one that knows about the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, but that's how long it's been. But it's been in, within two generations. And what happened then, just so you give you, I'm trying to give you a little perspective so you're not detached from it, is what, uh, I, I grew up in Oklahoma, and my folks grew up in the Depression. And my dad, thank the Lord, worked for an oil company. So we had food on the table, and, and we, we had milk cows, and we had living out on a, a company farm, they called them. And they were just like a farm. Dad had, dad had a couple milk cows, and we had, we'd bring hogs in, they'd butcher them. And we, we lived like farmers, but my dad was an oil worker, oil field worker, worked for Shell Oil Company. And uh, it reminds me uh, kind of akin to what Okies were all about. Well, there was a period there in, in, the, in the Dust Bowl, we would think well, we weren't, weren't in, directly in it, but there was nothing would grow. It literally, the topsoil, the wind blew the topsoil away. There wasn't any place for the, the plant seeds to take root. And it was that kind of famine that Ruth and Naomi were dealing with when they left. and Because the, the famine caused Naomi to go there and then famine and need caused her to go back, that and want to be with family. And so uh, that was that kind of way w with my family. Uh, Americans haven't known for generations uh, famine. They haven't known want, not having anything. Uh, we, we've been, I'll tell you what, folks, the Lord's kind of kept us all on a satin pillow for all these years up till now. And if, the, if some of the people that's burning it down right now <laughs> don't cut it out, we could, we could be knocked off those satin pillows real quick. And that's what we need to be praying for right now is God to be generous and to be merciful. And the scriptures tell us to be merciful to our enemies. And that's one of the things that Jesus was good at. He was told them, said, now you listen, you make provision for widows. You make provision for the hungry the poor, for children. You show them preference. Uh, you take care of your family, but you also t take care of those that don't have a daddy or are orphans. Or That's the teaching of God. Man didn't come up with this. And, you know, that was, at that time, uh, those ladies were destitute in the eyes of the rest of the world. But no, they weren't because they were in a blessed, because God had blessed the Jews. And he told the Jews, you bless the lives of those that aren't among you. And so uh, th they had some neat things. And, and it, but being the fact that using Ruth and Naomi as harvesters, the Jews had told them that you have fields that when you harvest, and basically uh, farming was primitive to say the least, but they would have these uh, harvesters. Have you ever seen the reaper? They had a, a, type, a scythe, they're called, kind of looks like, you've seen, I've seen them in antique shops and stuff, had a handle on them, and you could sweep them back and forth, and it would cut the grain. And then you'd have the, the gatherers who would gather that grain up in bundles, and then they would haul that to the threshing floor. And uh, I, when I was reading this, I was getting a real good education on primitive uh, agriculture, and it was fascinating how they did this. Everything was manual labor, hard, back-breaking. Can you imagine being in the hot, scorching sun in the fields all day? That's what Naomi and Ruth and their family did. Uh, closest thing I can come to is that sometimes these migrant uh, fruit pickers. Hey, a fruit picker's got it made compared to harvesting grain and carrying it. But anyway, this is where they're at now. They are finally in the fields of God's family. Provisions they made were 
Uh, if you had, God said, now, folks, if you're harvesting this stuff, don't go back and pick up the handfuls of grain that already falls out of the uh, chaff. He said, you leave that alone. You know who that's for? It's for the foreigners. It's for the people, that, the widows. It's for the impoverished. You let those people follow you and they pick up that grain and they can put that in their robes and carry it and take it home and eat it and survive. And so to me, isn't that a just and loving thought, God, even for the outsiders? Well, guess where Naomi was at, or excuse me, guess where Ruth was at and where Naomi was at? Naomi was with the bunch that was cutting and gathering. Where's Naomi or Ruth? I'll get it messed up, I'm sorry. Where was Ruth? Can you still hear me? Okay, good. Uh, Ruth was in the back with the foreigners, gathering, hand gathering. And so when they would end the day and Naomi would take her portion and Ruth would take her portion, Naomi noticed something. She says, well, you look at that. You got as much grain as I have. Well, that told her what an industrious young woman Ruth was. And Naomi was impressed by that. You know, she said, you're a hard worker. I did. You know, I've, I've always loved you, Ruth, but you are a hardworking woman, and you don't complain. You put in the same long hours. Of course, Naomi was old enough to be her mother. She was a mother-in-law. But she said, girl, you did. I can just hear you. I'm so proud of you. You're not complaining. You're glad to be here. You're praising God just like we are up there in the front. You're praising God back there in the back. And to me, that's such a touching uh, and speaks so well of both those women, the fact that they, they loved one another, they loved being together, and they supported one another. And that's some of the strength, again, I feel like that is, is more um, in you women than in us men. We tr we're tough guys. We're trying to make it alone. Well, they realized they needed each other. So when they would hike back to Bethlehem, uh, where Naomi was living, after they would work in the fields all day, they had their, their female chit-chats and uh, read the book of Ruth. It is, folks, it's so what, much worth your time. The dialogue, the discussion, the actions that goes on there, it's just priceless. It's worth every second of your time to read about them. So, uh, but anyway, I'm looking at my glasses, wanna make sure I don't run over. Uh, this time that they had together, uh, eventually uh, Naomi in their chit chat female discussions, Naomi says, Ruth, uh, and this translator, transliterated version, Ruth, do you want a husband? You know, I'm a widow, uh, but do you want a husband? I'm an older widow, you're a young, you're a young widow. You know, your sister Oprah is probably back there already making wedding plans to marry another Moabite man. Uh, do, do you want to get married? And, you know, Ruth's response was, again, hey, I'm, I'm happy with you. But uh, she took to heart what Naomi told her. You know, there's some wisdom and there's some benefit to you in having a husband. And you're a young woman, you're a young widow, and so we consider that. And you know, we have, we have uh, that happen in the Lord's church. Uh, women are widowed for any number of reasons, uh, a loss of a husband or a separation or a death uh, uh, or a, just a, a divorce. And what's, what's a woman to do? Because women are much more. I've got a, someone in our neighborhood that's going through a divorce and it saddens my heart, but I can relate to the woman. And guess who? She was the righteous one. She was the one doing right, not him. And so therefore, I empathize very strongly. You know, I think about however you lost him, you're at a disadvantage in, in society and in life. It's hard to be a single parent. It's hard to be a single person. And that's, that's why God instituted marriage so that we do have one another to strengthen us. And then we do have progeny. Uh, you know, I, I just love being around, I love being around my kids, but my grandkids too. 
there is a special blessing from God for all of us when we have family. Now, some of you, you know, are older and your kids, and now you've got grandkids, and probably some of you great grand. Well, I know some of you great grandkids, but you can't. You, I can't define the blessing that comes through God for having family, and it can change and be in any way, shape, or form. But always reach out and embrace. If you don't have a family here, adopt one. So, you know, Judy and I, both our parents are gone. And uh, something we did, I think just, it wasn't like, hey, here's our plan. Pick out that lovely, sweet, gray-headed lady that has no kids around here and make her your Naomi. Uh, but we did that, and we were blessed every time, weren't we? Nod your head. Yeah, she's nodding her head. We were blessed every time by having these surrogate dads, moms, grandparents, you know, uh, I, I can name any number of you in here right now. That's, you know it or not. I think you do know it. You're our surrogate parents. And uh, there are not too many surrogate grandparents because they can't be that old. But, you know, that was just like uh, Keith's uh, family and, and his mom and his mother. We, and, and I saw them being honored for their family and what they brought to Stroudsville Church. Uh, Folks, that is such a blessing from God, and if you don't see it for a blessing, then you're in a dysfunctional family because you got, you got to, you know, but you've got to be in the, among those that, that you love and that they love you, and, and it's, it's wonderful. Okay, I'm digressing, but I think it's understand that we, we need to relate ourselves to this, just not them. We're not spectators in God's family and in Christ's church. If you're a spectator, then you're missing the real blessing of it. And so it was with, with Naomi. As she talked to her little daughter-in-law, her daughter-in-law, I don't know if she's little or not, but as she talked to her, she said, Ruth, you need to maybe consider it would be a great benefit to you. And it wasn't, she wasn't talking about what she wanted. She wanted to talk about something she wanted for Ruth. And she said, uh, you know, in this country, we've got these uh, uh, redeemer, uh, kindred uh, redeemer. I'm just saying it now, but uh, basically, it's somebody in the family we're connected to, remote, and you can actually have him claim you uh, because of your relationship to me and my husband. He can claim you and your your son. Uh, uh, who died back there in Moab. And I think it's almost the way she responds was, really, okay, uh, should, should I do this? And she says, yeah, you need to be thinking about it. This paraphrase, Glenn's paraphrase. Yeah, you need to be thinking about that, your young woman. Okay, here comes old Boaz. Well, she had met him just right practically from the get-go. Ruth was working, and he come up, and he watched her, and he says, uh, again, Glenn's paraphrase, I am amazed at you, young woman. You are hardworking. You're an honorable. You're pleasant. You fit all the things that a godly woman should be. And he basically just pay, prayed, praised her to the heights. Okay, now fast forward on. Here comes Boaz again. And he sees this young woman in the thrashing floor. What they did, they brought all this grain that they was, the Jews were harvesting, and they would bring it into a thrashing floor, and they would thrash that grain and then pick, hand pick up the grain and store it in vessels uh, and, and keep it for when it's needed. And so uh, this is what was going on. Well, come the end of the day, uh, he, uh, Boaz was tired. He was wore out. So was Ruth. They was all working hard. Well, Boaz goes over there, and, uh, you know, it's a guy, like, uh, protecting his property. He, he just basically got in a bunch of his grain, uh, straw grain and stuff, kicked back, and was uh, like a straw mattress almost. He was laying there sleeping sound as a, you know, rock. And uh, Ruth, uh, and it was kind of cold then, and she got cold. And just as a natural response, she saw him over there laying and this, to me, this is so sweet and so innocent. And that was the thing where 
she, you know, she was a very proper and, and righteous woman, and so was Boaz. But she goes up there like a little dog and gets, it, gets his part of his uh, uh, robe and, and warms herself under it. And here he's asleep, put, put, matter of fact, exposed his feet. And he woke up, and his feet were cold. Boy, has that ever happened to you guys? Sometimes I'll be freezing to death, and it's the only thing sticking out of the bottom of the blanket is my feet. Well, Boaz woke up, and he looks down there, and it's real dark in this, in this room. And he, he realized it was Ruth. It was at the foot of his bed getting some body heat. And that's all that, that was going on, folks. It was all proper and very innocent. But, it, but having said that, he basically woke up and saw, well, uh, what are you doing here? Well, in that conversation that transpired, he realized that he had more than just um, admiration for her. He reinst restated that again. You know, you're that, you're that woman that I've seen that's just such a hard worker. You're such an example to everybody in our tribe. Uh, you're, you're, that, you're that Moabite woman. You're wonderful. And uh, basically, he said, you know, and he knew the rules. He said, you know, there's another guy in, this, in our tribe that's closer kindred to you as a kindred redeemer. In order for me to be honorable, I need to go to him. And he said, I'd like to make you my wife, but I'm a little older than you are, and out of deference to your age, you need to go to this younger redeemer, Kindred, Kindred Redeemer, and he has to give me permission to marry you, or it can't happen. If he claims you, and he said, you know, basically, and, you, and you're thinking, he, he really wants to marry her, but he's such an honorable man. He's not placing himself between her and him uh, because he's a younger man. And so he, he tells her, you go talk to him, and then we'll decide whether you can be my wife or not, or God will decide, actually, that's what he said. God will decide whether you will be my wife or not. And he did, and the fellow said, no. Nah. He said, I got other things going on. He said, that would mess my inheritance up, and I don't want to even go there. I started reading this stuff about you know, who's got to marry who and who gets to inherit what, and if they don't, and they, you know. And it basically revolved around the males, not the females. So what Boaz did was very honorable, saying, I'm going to give this guy first, first shot at Ruth, uh, even though I want to marry her, and she's such a godly woman. Uh, he's probably thinking, oh, I hope he doesn't pick her. And this guy said, no, no, I, I would lose part of my inheritance if I married this woman. Can't do it. And I bet if there's a Jewish word for Boaz, it's probably, oh, boy, I'll take care of that for you then. So he comes to Ruth. And he said, I am your selected. God has chosen me as your kinsman redeemer. So I can buy you, uh, ultimately buy, settle the estate of your father or any, anything to, to do with you, that part of the estate goes to, to that, that part of the male part of the family. And so he reconciled all of that and then he and Ruth became man and wife. Isn't that a beautiful story? Everybody's trying to do the right thing. Nobody's trying to, to flim-flam anybody. No, you know, that was, uh, was like Sarah and, and uh, her sister. We're going to talk about her in weeks to come. You know, nobody did a switcheroo or did anything shady or anything they should have been shamed of. It was just a beautiful, pure, sweet story of good and honest and honorable people doing the right thing. And boy, did God bless them. Uh, I'm just about the end of the story. Uh, but I do want to close with this. Remember this. Who is David's grandpa? Come on, Gene. Anybody. Who's Bo as his ancestors? Let me give that. Um, who? Obed, Jesse. Who was Jesse? David. Okay. Who was, who was after David? The big one at the end. Solomon. Bigger than them all. Huh? Christ. Jesus Christ. That woman, Ruth, was Jesus Christ's ancestor. She was a Moabite. Folks, that tells us what God has done.
for us all. We are Moabites. We're Moabites. And yet God has chosen us to be a part of his family and a part of his kingdom. Huh? Yes. Oh, yeah. You start. Yeah. We're getting to them. That, that's amazing how God used those people. There's a lot of bigots say those people to be a part of his family. And that's a cautionary and, and also a, a glorious inheritance for us. I don't know where Harrison at. Harrison, are you back there? He probably shut me off, I think, at 10 after. Are we done? Two? Okay, a couple minutes. Well, uh, I'm going to do the same format uh, for next week, and I got this wonderful uh, uh, suggestion, nomination for Ruth this week. So you did good uh, getting Ruth because that was a perfect, perfect uh, Bible book to study and person to study. So just if you see me this week, text me, call me, grab me by the, well, don't grab me, COVID. Uh, just let me know what you would like, what woman in the Bible that you would like to study for next week. Make it quick, because if you don't, I'll do my own. Okay. You all be blessed for the rest of this week, and uh, hang in there. I'm not good at this stalling for we're down to about a minute. Is that it, Harrison? Okay, it is. We'll see you all in worship.